You know, one of the great things about working with God in general is that He not only gives gifts, He multiplies gifts. And I think if you've been watching closely, He has multiplied several gifts here in our church. The Lord has blessed us with a praise team, with young people that are not just sitting down and and listening, but are involved in worship and leading out. So I wanted to thank you, the church family, for supporting our youth and the future of our church. Church is a lot more exciting when it's not something that you watch, but something you participate in. And I know many of you are involved with lots of these meetings that we're having after fellowship lunch. But it's January, and we're excited about what the year has in store for us. We're planning, and we're going to be having trainings available, and all kinds of things, because we want this church to be a place where you come to be encouraged, equipped, and challenged to go out there and make a difference. The church is not about coming to the church and sitting down and then leaving. It's about being transformed and going to bring about transformation wherever you go. You see, the, the point of us even collecting the, the, the offerings and the tithe is for the sake of mission. This building exists for the sake of mission. And as it was shared here, thank you so much for your faithful contributions. Because of that, this year, each ministry can start with enough funds to do what they feel called to do. They can buy their resources. They can plan ahead. They can move forward because we have the funds in place. And I thank you for that. I received a couple of phone calls of families that needed help. And I looked at the funds that we have and I said, you know what? We can help you. We can help families in the community that are going through needs because of your generous donation. So thank you. You have allowed us to be a light in our community. Now, it's not enough just for you to donate. It's important for you to live out the life. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. You know, there's an expression in English, walking the walk, because, you know, Talk is cheap, right? It's, it's easy to talk. It's easy to say I'm a Christian. It's easy to list the things that I believe, but to live like I believe in those things, to live like those things are really true, that is the challenge. I hope you have your Bibles with you. We're going to be taking a look at it. We're not going to be opening them just yet. We're going to do a little bit of reviewing, but then we're going to be jumping in. So if you just want to have them handy, uh, last week... We talked about who gets to be God. Remember, we were talking about lordship. And we went all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent talks to Eve and says, Hey, you know, if you eat this fruit, you're going to get to be God. Many times when we deny God the lordship that he deserves, it's because we're placing ourselves as our own lords. We also talked about last time, then who am I? Once we recognize that God is God, we also find ourselves in mission. We find ourselves children of God, and we find out what that means as we live out our lives. Colossians 3.23, we read that whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. I don't work for anybody else. I work for God. The things that I do, I do my best because it's a testimony of who is God. My Lord. And then we also talked about the kingdom of God. What does that mean? You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then he will take care of everything else. So in, in summary, once you settle the lordship issue, and you realize what kingdom you belong to, and who is king, everything else in life falls into place. And today we're talking about what does that look like, seeking the kingdom of God first. What does it look like when God is my king, when he is my Lord? And if you notice that I'm a little bit nervous today, it's because my parents are here. Uh, my mom and my dad, they're to blame for me being alive. And I'm very grateful for them. And I learned to preach listening to my dad and... Um, encouraged to be involved in church and learn all the bible stories from my mom ever since i was little so i'm very grateful for for christian and godly parents so if you have any complaints about me take it to them it's their fault 
You know, in, in Matthew chapter 7, if you turn there with me, we'll start our Bible study there. Matthew chapter 7. It's a long chapter. It's, it's a wonderful chapter. We could do a whole series just on Matthew chapter 7, but we're going to be skipping to verse 21. And before we read, I just want to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. As we open the Bible, we do not want to read it without first asking for your Holy Spirit to guide us. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of this book, we ask for that same Holy Spirit to now come into our hearts and teach us what you would have us learn from the words. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 21, Jesus is speaking here. And he says, not everyone who says to me, what? Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does what? The will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is saying, coming to church, raising your hands and saying, Lord, Lord, is not what gets you into heaven. Because it's easy for me to pay lip service. Right? How many people do you hear them say that family is their first priority? And then you ask them, how much time did you dedicate to family this past week? Well, um, oh, you see, you know, this was an interesting week because how many people say, no, God is my top priority? Oh, really? How much time did you dedicate to your relationship with God this week? Well, you have to understand that this week there are certain things that so Jesus is saying, saying, Lord, Lord, wearing a t-shirt that says Jesus on it, you know, claiming to be a Christian and showing up once a week to listen to a message is not what saves you. Jesus explains this a little bit further, but in verse 22, he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? I mean, these sounds like Christians. These sound even like Christian leaders. People who are doing ministry in the name of Jesus. What does Jesus say to them in verse 23? And then I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who do what? Practice lawlessness. So could it be that living a life without law, disregarding the law, disregarding what God has in mind for me, could undo the things that I claim with my mouth or even the good things that I do with my life? There, there's a, a common perception nowadays. It's not really theology. But there's a lot of people, some of them around my age, a little bit younger, that if I ever talk to them about spiritual things, they say, you know, I'm, I'm, that's great for you and I'm very happy for you. And, and I grew up going to church. And I just want you to know that even though I'm not going to church right now, I'm a good person. You know, I, I volunteer. I help those who are in need. You know, I, and I'm a good person. This text, I believe one of the things that it's talking about here is that my good works can never make up for the times that I fell short of God's law. The, the requirements of God, the things that he calls for me to do, when I fail to do those things, but I go and do extra good things, these extra good things never make up for the part where, does that make sense? For the parts that I failed, Jesus had to die for me. And the good things that I do are not to make up for them, that they never will. Practicing lawlessness, going against the will of God will not, will, uh, will condemn me. But doing good things will not save me. If I claim to be a Christian, and I go to church and I raise my hands and I sing the right songs and I, and I have memorized the right verses. But I'm living a life of sin and disobedience. The things that I say don't matter much. Does that make sense so far? We're going to be talking more about this. 
that saying the good things is important. Like that song, I believe we were singing that. And, and I was touched. Like, this is so beautiful. The things that we believe. And if we can live our life like we believe in those things, it'll be wonderful. A lot of people have an issue with Christianity, not because of Jesus, but because of bad relationships with Christians. It's people who claim to be Christians, but don't live according to what Jesus has called us to live, according to how he called us you know, to, to love your neighbors and forgive your enemies and, and lots of other things. When they fall short of that, it, it messes up the picture of Jesus. So we're going to be talking about this morning as we continue about the importance of not just saying the right things and claiming the right things, but actually living out what Jesus calls us to do. You see, in Matthew 7, he's at the, the tail end here of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a part that comes next. It's also repeated in Luke, and I like the way that Luke puts it. So we're going to jump over to Luke. It's the same story with chapter 6, starting with verse 46. And I'm in Mark, and that's no wonder it was looking weird. Luke 6, and make sure you're in Luke, starting with verse 46. Jesus says, but, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Part of saying that Jesus is our Lord is being willing to follow him. Once again, we, we mentioned this and when we first began this series, we struggle with lordship because we live in America. We don't have lords. We don't have kings. We recognize that the power really comes from us. We set up the leaders and if we don't like them, we'll put somebody else in their place. Right? It's a very American way of approaching things. So we come to the Bible and we hear about Lord and we're like, I, I don't understand. And Jesus here is saying, calling me Lord... But not doing what I ask you to do doesn't do you any good. Then I'm not really your Lord. So I say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do the things which I say? He goes on to explain verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep. And lay the foundation where? On the rock. Now, look at what happens next. When the flood did what? Arose. And the stream did what? Beat vehemently against that house. And could not shake it. For it was what? So let me ask you this. Does building your house on the rock prevent the flood from coming? No. If the flood comes, does it mean that you built your house in the wrong place? No. This person built the house in the right place. The flood still came. And it wasn't weak. The streams came and they beat vehemently against the house. So the trials still came. The tribulations, the challenges, the difficulties, they came and they beat against that house. And they tried to break the house. But it couldn't. Because the house was built on the foundation. A solid foundation. And Jesus here is talking about Doing the things that he says. You see, I believe the things that I do. Let me explain that a little bit better. I can say I believe in exercise. But if I never exercise, I don't really believe in exercise. But if I'm getting up and I'm going there and I'm exercising and I'm sweating and it smells bad and it hurts and I'm exhausted and the sweat is dripping, I start to think, well, I must really believe in exercise because it sure isn't fun, but I'm still doing it. You know, if, if I say I believe in helping others, but I never really help anybody unless it's convenient, I don't really believe in helping others. But if I find myself volunteering and stressed out and tired and there's a million things to do, but I'm still volunteering, I guess I must really believe in helping others. And just talk to anybody that volunteers with Pathfinders or Adventurers or Vacation Bible School. Those people believe in helping others. Another thing, we had a memorial service here on Thursday, right? It was Thursday. 
the church was full, and we provided them with a meal afterwards. And as I saw people coming in and coming in and coming in, and I should know better, but I began to worry. It's like, Lord, it's a lot of people. Do we have enough food? And I was thinking about what I brought. It's like, I, I should have brought twice as much as I brought. I mean, I thought it was enough, but now looking at this. And, and then, you know, we finish and, you know, everybody. And then I let them know, hey, we have, we have food. And people started coming in. And the ladies were doing an amazing job. The ladies that we have in this church just uncovering and warming things up. And thank you so much to so many of you that got out of work, came here, dropped something off, and went back to work. Because people came and the fellowship hall was full. Every chair, there was somebody sitting on them, they were fellowshipping. I mean, this is people that travel from far away. They're visiting family, they're grieving. And we were, <coughs> we were able to provide them with food, with an atmosphere to fellowship. And they ate, and they came back and they had seconds. And people left and took food home. And it's because of this church that was willing to come out of their way to be a blessing for somebody else. You know, whenever I, I talk with somebody that has come and visit us, they always mention, I just felt so loved by that church. And this is what happens. This is what happens when we take the words of Jesus and we act on them. We say, well, I must really believe in this. And it strengthens your faith. Your house is stronger because you're doing the things that you say you believe. I don't just say I believe in Jesus. I actually live my life like I believe in Jesus. And then when the storm comes, you say, no, I believe in this. But there is another group. As we continue to read, it says, But he who heard, verse 49, and did nothing. So they came and they heard the sermon, they read the Bible, they're familiar with the teachings of Jesus. But do none of it. It's like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. The house looks the same, except there's no foundation against which the stream beat vehemently. And immediately, what happened? It fell. Was it just a little bit of a ruin? The ruin of that house was great. It, completely, it was completely destroyed. It fell apart. Looking at them, they both just look like houses. The other person thought they believed, but never showed up. Never put in the time or the effort. Never allowed himself or herself to be placed out of their comfort zone for the sake of the gospel. So when things got tough, they're like, I'm just going to walk away from this. The faith was weak. The problem is not the storm because the storm comes to everybody. Don't blame the storm. The question is, are you living your house are you living your life? Are you building your house like you believe in the words of Jesus and you allow those words to shape how you live? Or is it just intellectual knowledge? And I've, I've met some people. They have memorized huge parts of the scripture. They can win an argument with you if you debate with them, you know, about the Bible. But at the time, I was a youth pastor. And they ministered to their children. Adventurers and pathfinders, we go camping together. I see them for uh, our, our youth events and we talk afterwards and we sit together for lunch, fellowship lunch. And from the children, I would hear what things were really like in, at home. You see, it's easy to look like a Christian in church. And everybody shows up and you smell good and you look good and you, you have your tie or your dress or your skirt or you know whatever and you, and you smile and you say happy Sabbath. And... But from the children I found out who lived at home according to their beliefs and who didn't. It was a sad story of a father that came to me once and says, Pastor, you have to talk to my daughter. She ran away from the house. Not only that, she's living with a family. And they're not even Christians. And I went to talk with the daughter. We had a ministry on campus. She was in college. And, and she came and, and I, I had texted her and we, we, we met there and in between classes and we were talking. And I said, no, what's going on? Are you okay? She said, Pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. You see my dad showing up at church. And everybody thinks he's like that. But he's abusive to my mom. 
and he would beat me. Pastor, I'm 20 years old. Says this family I'm living with, yeah, they're not Christians. But I've seen the love of God more in their family than I ever saw in my own. How do I give a Bible study to a young lady like that? She knew the texts. She knew the doctrine. She knew all about Jesus. But she never experienced it lived out in her life. The power of the gospel, it's amazing, it's beautiful, but it has to be lived out. The words of Jesus are incredible, nothing compares to them, but it has to be lived out. If it's only here and repeated with your lips, it doesn't do, not even close to what it's supposed to do, what it's able to do in your life when you surrender to Jesus. You see, it's not enough to simply hear the words of Jesus. Well, anybody can listen. It's about doing. It's about living it out. Let me illustrate it for you with a story about a group of people. About a dozen people from a southern state. They decided to go up to New York City. They wanted to listen. They wanted to watch the musical My Fair Lady. So they took their train. They went up to New York uh, City. They got to Broadway. But when they got there, they realized the tickets were sold out. They didn't realize they had to call in advance, purchase their tickets, you know, and, and then show up. They got there and it was already sold out. See, the problem was that before leaving, they had bragged to their friends that they were going to go and watch the show. Kind of rubbed it in their faces, you know, we're going to New York, we're going to watch this show. And I was like, how can we go back home without having watched the show? They're going to make fun of us. Oh, and they were standing outside and they were distraught and they were worried. And then one of the sessions ended, and as people were coming out, they were throwing away their ticket stubs. And they had an idea. So they went there, and they collected ticket stubs, enough to have one for each person. They went in, and they bought the booklet of the musical. And then they went to a record store across the street and bought the CD with all the songs in it. They went back to their hotel room. They read the booklet, they listened to the songs, they practiced the songs, and then they went back home the next day, singing the songs, talking about the musical, and trying to fool everybody that they had seen the, mus the musical, except that deep down inside, they experienced the emptiness of the lie. They had not really witnessed it. They were only talking about something that they had heard of, but never really experienced Sure, they fooled some people, but their experience was hollow. It was empty. It was just for show. Isn't it sad that some Christians end up behaving in a similar way? They talk Christianity. They speak. They know, they know the words to say, but they never really experience the gospel, the joy, the freedom, the hope that comes from a real relationship with Jesus, not just from hearing of people who have a relationship with Jesus. S.M. Lockridge, a famous preacher, he says, there's three groups of people. Those who neither call him Lord, nor do the things that he says. Those who call him Lord, but do not do the things that he says. Those who call him Lord and do the things that he says. All of us fall into one of those groups. And only you know the truth. It's very easy for you to fool me. You just have to look nice when you come to church. Say all the nice, all the, the right things to me when I visit you at home. And you got me fooled. But between you and God, and usually your spouse, your children, they, they'll know. Your co-workers, your neighbors, usually they'll, they'll have an idea. Which of these three groups are you in? You know, the evidence of professing God and loving God is obeying God. Partial obedience is not obedience at all. It's just convenience. Right? It's, it's like me obeying my mom every time that it's convenient for me. I was already going to do that anyway, so yeah, I'll obey you. But then when it's not convenient, think of it as, as a couple getting married. Right, and they promise all these things, and then you know, in sickness and in health, and in you know, in wealth or in poverty, you know, I'll always be you and true to you, and and only you. I mean, unless somebody else comes along that's really like a lot better than you, 
then, you know, then the deal's off. That, that's not really a commitment, right? It's until death do us apart or, you know, I change my mind halfway through. I mean, marriage, when it's done right, it could be such a beautiful illustration of our relationship with God. It's no wonder Satan attacks it so much. So many people have no idea what a happy marriage would look like. They've been hurt. They've been mistreated. They've been abused. And it gets to the point where they, they have a hard time relating to God because Satan has messed up their life so much. And we think that relationships are really, you know, not about self-sacrifice. I go into a relationship to be happy. It's really all about me. And we come to God with the same expectations. Okay, God, we're in this relationship, but it's really all about me, right? Because that's what every relationship I've ever been in has been all about. It's either all about me, and the moments I've given of myself to somebody else, that person took it all and then ran off. And we're scared. And God's saying, love me, give yourself to me, all of you. And we're saying, are you sure, Lord? Can you handle this? He can. He has a pretty good track record of always, always, always being faithful. And you're a witness of that. The fact that you're still alive is because God is merciful. And not the fact that I'm standing here is because God has been so patient with me. And my mom, you know, there's plenty of reasons for her to just kind of throw me out the window a couple of times. But, you know, she's been patient. And God is patient with us. But just because He's patient and gracious and kind, let us never fool ourselves into thinking that He's okay with a half-hearted commitment. And ultimately, it doesn't hurt God, it hurts us. We don't experience the full love of the relationship because we're afraid of committing. And the more that we're afraid of committing, the less we experience of His love and His saving grace. It's hard. Many of us have been baptized. And there's a story that I read that's really interesting. Speaking of baptism and commitment, there's, there's this ancient warrior. He was very skilled at war. And soon he began to conquer the kingdoms around him. And he began to expand his kingdom even beyond those borders. And he was so busy battling and winning wars that he never stopped to find a wife. His advisors were scared. They said, look, you're getting older. Chances are, one of these days, you're going to die. We need an heir. Otherwise, your whole kingdom will fall apart. He said, but I, I don't have time to find a wife. You know, I'm, I'm winning these wars. I'm expanding the kingdom. This is what I want to do. You find me a wife. Okay. So they did. They traveled to a faraway land. And they found the daughter of the king. She was educated. She was strong. She was wise. She would be the perfect addition to, already par to an already powerful man. They said, together, these two, they're going to conquer the world. So they came back to the warrior and they said, look, we found you the perfect woman. The issue is... Her, her father said, you can only marry her if you come over and convert to the local religion. He said, okay, I'll go there. And he came. And he went there and they had set aside a tutor for him to teach him about their religion. Except that this great warrior, he was aware that people wanted him dead. So he never traveled without a few of his close friends. 500 of the fierce warrior this world had ever seen armed in full battle gear and they went with him for his what we would call bible studies right he went there to learn about the the religion so they they got some extra teachers you know to teach him about you know their religion and it's kind of just you know okay yeah let's let's go through it and then the the day of the wedding came and i said okay just before the wedding because the father really wanted to not have to worry about this man coming over and taking over his kingdom. He's taking over everything. This man is a genius at war. He says, we need to get him, you know, to make peace with him. He says, before you get married, uh, you need to be baptized. Now, you guys didn't cover this before, but fine. You know, he's there, he's 500 men in full armor. So, okay, you have to go, you know, go into the water it's, you know, it's, it's by immersion. It's a lot like we have, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's you're going to be a new person when you come out of there. 
Okay, and then the soldiers all marched into the water, full of their gear. And then the religious leaders and the political leaders, they get together and say, there's a problem. What's the problem? They have their weapons and, and everything. We can't baptize them. There's, you can't have a baptized warrior. When you join, you have to become a pacifist. You can't be you know, a member of our religion and be a warrior at the same time. Okay, well, you tell them. No, you tell them. So finally he says, no, what's taking so long? And he comes over there and they're talking. He says, what's the problem? And they're like, well, you see, we can't baptize you and have you still be warriors. They're, they're trying to you know, defuse the threat here. And he says, oh, I have a solution for that. You know, he thought for a little bit. He says, I, I know what we can do. And, and he told them the solution. And they're like, well, it doesn't really solve the problem. We but then they took a look at him and he was a big guy. They saw the 500 men there with full battle gear. I said, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll do it. You know, we'll work with you. So each soldier was baptized. But as they were baptized, they kept their sword and their arm out of the water. And he became known as the unbaptized arm. So sure, they belong to that religion, but the arm with the sword doesn't. So, you know, they, they got the marriage. And, and this story just goes to illustrate, do we do that sometimes? Lord, I'll give all of myself to you, except for, you know, this little part of me. Yes, Jesus, I'm all in, except for, for this little thing. And you know, nobody's perfect, so I can keep this little thing. You know, we're going to sin until Jesus comes, so I'll just keep this little thing here, and it's, it's okay. And Jesus says, no, it's not okay. For me to be your Lord, I have to be Lord of all. Otherwise... Not really Lord at all. And that's the trick, right? I mean, Christianity is great. We're saved by grace. God comes and blesses us, gives us gifts, gives us talents, takes care of us, takes care of all of our enemies and issues. He promises He will take us and give us eternal life. It's so good. Except for one little part. He wants your heart and your mind and your soul your gifts and your talents and your body and your health and everything, your relationships, everything, nothing can be above God. He owns all of us. And if we think about it, it makes sense. I mean, He created us. Then He dies for us, redeems us, is willing to give us what we could never get for ourselves, eternal life. The health that we have right now is a gift from Him. The resources, that we have, the resources that we have right now are a gift from Him. The job that we have is a gift from Him. The fact that we are breathing right now is a gift from Him. He has provided us with everything that we needed to have the success that we have right now. And even when we fail and when we fall short and when we turn away from Him, He refused to let us go. Continues to draw us closer to Him. We can trust Him to be Lord of all. Trust Him with everything that we have all areas of our life, nothing left out of the water when we're surrendered, when we're baptized. Speaking of baptism, in case you haven't taken that step, I had announced we would have one next Sabbath. I'm going to push it further one week, the first Sabbath of next month, January, February. First Sabbath of February, we're going to fill up the baptistry. There may be some of you here who've been coming to church for a while and haven't really been baptized. Someone came to me recently and said, I, I've been baptized, but listening to the messages and things I've been going through, I want to be rebaptized. That's okay too. A recommitment to God. If you're interested in that, I want to talk to you. Because we can't play around with this. Jesus is either Lord of all or not at all. Don't be that person talking about the play. Be the one that experienced it. Like, I know because God did this. For me, not for my neighbor, not just for my mom or for my dad or for my friend. For me, in my life, a real, honest walk with God. He's given us Jesus. He's giving us everything. It's not too much for Him to ask for us to give to Him the little that we have. I give you the invitation. I give you the challenge to not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Amen.